We have a wispy solar storm that could graze Earth, and a big flare player rotates into view with more soon to follow. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com dot edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is remaining a bit on the calm side. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, you can see there's not a lot of activity going on. However, back around late on the 6th, you can see near region 3270, whoosh, there's a neat little uh, solar storm that's launched that's going to go south of Earth for the most part. But then on the 7th, you can see another one about mid-disk, whoosh, another gentle solar storm launch. Now, both of these launches really look like they're going to go south of Earth, but we could get a grazing passage starting around the 11th, possibly into the 12th, and not expecting all that much activity, but it could give a little bit of aurora to high latitude. So aurora photographers, you know, be aware of that. You could get a little bit of something. Meanwhile, we also have a small coronal hole that's going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone right around the same time. So we could get some fast solar wind from that. Again, just giving a little bit of a, a nice bump for aurora at high latitudes. But the big story is really region 3272. This region in the south has been rotating. Uh, it's not in the Earth strike zone yet, but it has fired off a couple of big M-class flares at an R1 level radio blackout. Hasn't launched any Earth-directed solar storms, but that could change as it begins to rotate toward this Earth's center disk. So over the next week, we are going to be watching it. And there's going to be other regions that are rotating into Earth view here over the next couple days. So expect that flare risk to rise. And we could get more radio blackouts here over this next coming week. Switching to our M flare threat meter, as you can see, over the past week, we've actually been pretty quiet. There haven't been a lot of big solar flares, but right around the 4th, we could see that the X-ray flux began to rise a little bit. We've actually now clipped up above the sea floor, and this also means by proxy that the solar flux is rising. In fact, most of this has been due to region 3272. Right around the 6th, you can see it actually popped a big M-class flare. This was an R1 level radio blackout, but this was before the region was even fully into view. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders on Earth's day side, be aware we are having uh, radio blackouts now and they could get bigger and longer. It all depends upon what's going to happen with this region. We also have another region that's going to rotate into Earth view that looks like it could also be a big flare player. So just be aware that big flares are back on the menu and radio blackouts are once again going to join us along with more noise on the radio bands. Now switching to our solar storm conditions, after that big G4 level solar storm that we had clear back on the 24th, things have really calmed down. In fact, the only time we've actually reached storm levels since then was back on the 30th. We reached storm levels for just a short bit before things kind of hovered around active conditions. Most of this has been due to some grazing solar storms, kind of like the ones that we're getting now, or these, these wispy things that are coming off. And so you can see we've actually jumped to active conditions and then back down to unsettled conditions, but likely things are going to continue right in this vein. We might back bump back up to active conditions when the, the set of solar storms that are kind of going to graze us here in the next few days when they actually do so. Till then, you know, we're just going to have to hang tight and just know that the conditions will stay just about like they are. Now, switching to that recent G4 level solar storm we had back on March 24th, not only did we get a roar clear down to places like South Carolina and Texas, New Mexico and Arizona, and as far north as places like Tasmania and Perth, Australia, but a roar wasn't the only visible impact. Rocket Lab also delayed their launch of a black sky payload for over a couple hours. And with over 3,000 people watching their live stream and waiting, they finally mentioned it online and also then later on their live stream. 
Now, the original launch was scheduled for a time when the Earth was still passing through the core of the solar storm. So they decided to play it safe, and they waited. Luckily, Earth was actually nearing the end of the storm, and it only took a couple hours before it became clear we had passed through the entire core, and the effects began to wane. So they locked up a new time, and the launch went off without a hitch. Now, Rocket Lab was not the only launch that was impacted that day. SpaceX also had Starlink launch number 79 be impacted. Now, it wasn't a delay this time because of the solar storm, but it did mean that the orbit insertion for the satellites had to be raised from 270 kilometers up to 320 kilometers in order to avoid all the excess drag from the inflated atmosphere due to that solar storm. But even at that, once the satellites were in their orbit insertion, they managed to lose five kilometers of altitude in less than two days during their PLT checkout. Nonetheless, everything turned out okay, and those satellites have now been boosted to higher orbits. But it just goes to show you that space weather is finally becoming a real player in the launch window trade space, and both Rocket Lab and SpaceX, they're setting precedents for the future. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, this is Stereo A. It's our partially far-sighted monitor. You can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun just a tiny bit from the side. And when we take a look at Stereo A, you can see that small coronal hole in the north. That is the one that's going to be rotating into the Earth's strike zone here over the next couple days. And you can also take a look in the south, and you can see that one active region that's really kind of gurgling and burgling. That one is region 3272. That's the big flare player that we've just rotated into Earth view. But look to the east limb. You can actually see another region in the south that's coming uh, after that one. That looks like that could be yet another big flare player. So we're going to be expecting so that the flare activity could rise easily over the next maybe four or five days as this region not just rotates into stereo's view but also into earth view so expect that solar flux to rise we could get back into the 150s and expect that big solar flares could be on the menu easily over the next week or more switching to our moon we are now coming out of the full moon on our way to a third quarter and by the 13th the moon will be about 49 percent illuminated so you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, you're going to have this bright companion to deal with. So you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating that grazing passage from those solar storms that are going to go south of Earth, and it's going to be followed by some fast solar wind, but the, the impact is going to be pretty minor. So at high latitudes, if you're an aurora photographer, you'd be expecting active conditions with up to about a 30% chance of a major storm, and that would last basically as we move through the middle of this upcoming week, but by the weekend, things should be calming down. Now, mid-latitudes, the story is a lot quieter. We're actually only expecting unsettled conditions, and we have about 20% chance of active conditions, again, right around the 11th and possibly through the 12th, but it's going to be very underwhelming. So if you're a roar photographer at mid-latitudes, uh, you probably want to sit this one out and wait for some bigger storms later. Switching to your solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we do have a couple big flare players on the Earth-facing disk. One of them, region 3270, is going to be rotating to the sun's far side here in the next 24 to 48 hours. But region 3272 is going to keep those uh, radio blackouts coming. In fact, we are sitting right now at about 130s for solar flux. This means good uh, radio propagation on Earth's dayside. We could ramp up even further, possibly up closer to the 150s into the next week as more regions rotate into Earth view. But all this is keeping the noise on the radio bands at the moderate range. In fact, NOAA is expecting about a 30% chance of M-class flares over the next few days, uh, and this means a 30% chance of R1 to R2 level radio blackouts, and this is going to continue easily over this next week, and it possibly may rise again as these new regions rotate into view. The nice thing is that R3 level radio blackouts, nah, it doesn't look like we're going to see that very much. So amateur radio operators, you know, we're going to have to just deal with those blackouts on the day side but at least radio propagation stays in the good range easily through this week and the next week as well. Now, as we switch to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, well, everything is wonderful right now. We are in the D1 normal range all the way across the board, and we have a very low risk 
four radiation storm at the S1 to S2 level, and that's because really Region 3270 isn't been firing any big flares, and we're just kind of hanging on and taking a look at it, but it looks like it's going to rotate to the sun's far side with no issues, and region 3272, well, it's got a, probably another 10 days before we start seeing that radiation storm risk rise, and that's because it has to be really to the west limb before we see any real intense chance for radiation storms. So this is a good week, a uh, good week to fly, and everything looks in the green. So the space weather this week is staying a bit on the calm side as far as solar storms go. We do have a couple solar storms that are on their way, but they're probably going to go south of Earth and just graze us a little bit. Now, Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, this could mean you could get a little bit of a show. Don't expect a lot, but we do have that coronal hole that's also rotating in through the Earth strike zone, and that could enhance things just a bit for you. So we could expect some activity from about the 11th through about the 13th before things calm down. But again, it's not going to be all that active. Meanwhile, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you're dealing with a new big flare player on the Earth-facing disk. This is region 3272, and it has been firing big flares about an R1 level radio blackout. Likely that's going to remain about the same. But we do have a new region that looks like it could rotate into view in about three to maybe four days, and it will actually cause uh, some potential for more radio blackouts for you. So just know that that's going to be pretty much the state of things over this next week, but expect radio propagation to stay a bit on the good side. And now you GPS users, well, you know, things aren't too bad. We are having a, a few radio blackouts here and there that makes the dawn and dusk terminator areas a little bit dicey, but the solar storming, well, it's not all that big a deal. So Aurora shouldn't be too much of a problem. So as long as you stay away from those dawn dusk terminators, your GPS reception should be pretty good. Happy Easter, everyone. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.